I know we are overrunning, but could we at least devote another 15 minutes to Q&A from the floor? And there are mics down the centre. Um, for those of you who just have burning things to say or to share or even a question to any of the panel members uh, sitting up here with me, please just walk up to the mic and, and, and ask your question or give your comment. Anything at, at all in response to um, some of the issues that the panelists have raised, including the need for um, more sponsorship expertise? The mic is just behind you. Thank you. If you could just introduce yourself as well and where you're from. Um, I'm Karen. Uh, I'm an arts manager. Uh, this questions go, uh, go out to uh, Mr. Kwok. Um, do you have an example of a very innovative way of engaging uh, one of the four groups that you mentioned? Um, if you could share with us the uh, innovative example of uh, arts group engaging with one of the four groups you mentioned. Thank you. Um, I, I may not have an example, but uh, for example, when we talk about integrated resorts and the, the spike in the statistics after that year, really it's about the kinds of shows that were brought in and so on. But in, in an ecosystem where you need that kind of cultural diversity, you could imagine some of the kinds of uh, investments uh, or, or some of the profits that come from, from the industry to be devoted to, to the arts. Now, I don't have a concrete example here, but for, for the property sector, there, there are issues about how bricks and mortar as property need to be accompanied by what you might call cultural property of a more intangible kind and the making of a city. So, for example, uh, I, I gather that there is now a, a big industry going on called place-making. Right? And it, it's got to do with how to make places more attractive, more livable, and so on. So you can't imagine, for example, how arts is not part, part of that equation. And, and for the media, this is again not the forum to, to criticise the, 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 the media for its lack of of good coverage of, of the arts. But from another standpoint, if you think about it comparatively, for the kind of arts development that we have had over recent years, the media has not caught up in reflecting these kinds of deeper experiments and questioning that have been going on in Singapore. So when I say uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, involvement and so on, it may not necessarily be in the form of money alone, but support of all kinds, including exposure and also what might be called public education and not just left to Ministry of Education. If somebody is stirred to watch a play and he or she has never watched a play before and that play makes a difference in his or her life and he or she brings his son or daughter and the son and daughter grows up becomes successful, gets four A's and A levels and becomes whatever else and so on, then we are talking about generations which are more attuned so that whatever they do, the arts is never a neglected dimension of public life. Actually, Ken Woon, if I can just pick up on your point, I mean, we were talking about the four areas which we feel private sector funding is lacking from lottery to banking finance, property and media. Why do you think, when it comes to this issue of sustainability, why do you think... This, we, are, we are so behind in terms of private sector funding. It's, are the arts that we make, that we have been making in the last 40, 50 years, not speaking to this group of people? I mean, is it relevant to our society? And if it is, and people hunger and want it, why aren't we stepping forward? The wider public, private corporations, why aren't they stepping forward to, to, to want to give? Why is there a lack of conviction? I think there are a few problems. I'm not sure I agree with uh, Ken Woon's categorization. Not, 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 not because you're wrong to say that many companies can actually do a lot more. One of the big problems for the arts and arts donations is the arrival of corporate social responsibility, CSR. Now, 
because companies misbehaved in many, many ways, somewhere along the way, somebody said to them, well, you all have to make a corporate social responsibility statement as to what your company will do with its funds. And so if you go look at the corporate social responsibility statements of companies like Capital Land and so forth, they state explicitly that they will make donations, but only for narrow subsets, for, ch uh, for children, for uh, charities relating to children. Other companies will say they will do it for healthcare. Or it's so much easier for them to sell the idea to their shareholders at annual general meetings that they will donate to um, worthy causes. Unfortunately, the arts is contentious often and therefore falls out of the list of things that they explicitly say they'll do. So whereas in the past, I could have called the CEO of um, Capital Land and said, please, please, please. Um, today, he'll just point me to the relevant, relevant passage in his annual report and say, sorry. Um, I'm already giving, I've told my shareholders, I'm only doing these things. So it's become a bit of a crutch and an excuse. And I wouldn't mind if we got rid of all these CSR statements. Thanks, Yulin. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, yes, please. Uh, yes, my name is Ken Hickson. I'm a, actually a sustainability consultant, but I, I have my f fingers and feet in quite a few pies, including the business community as well as uh, media. So I've, and I've observed the, the Singapore art scene for uh, around 30 years, so I've sort of had my fingers in a few local pies as well. Uh, I just want to make the observation, and particularly picking up on the last point about corporate social responsibility, because sustainability and corporate social responsibility go together very, very closely and very well, certainly in, a, in bu the business community and in their minds. So investing in the arts could well mean investing in sustainability or investing in corporate social responsibility, if you can see it in that wider sense. And also, I suppose, the arts can be seen as also a, a vehicle, if you like, to promote advocacy of social issues and things that are important. And I think there are a lot in this room who obviously see their role as artists in terms of communicating important issues and important things, whether it's through stage, through performance, through visual arts as well. So I think there's a strong connection between sustainability, not just in terms of the economic sustainability of the arts, but involving the arts in all the other aspects of sustainability, which to me includes economic, environmental, ethical, uh, and uh, energy, or the, the, the world of, of sustainability incorporates uh, energy. So I think what I'm saying is, and maybe it's not a question, but it's really just to bring together some of these points that I think we need to see the arts as a vehicle to promote a lot of these other things that are very important in society. And to me, I came here because I'm involved in sustainability and I'm very keen on the arts and I can see a strong connection. And I'm just, maybe there's some comment from some of the panelists and I, I've really appreciated some of the points that have been made. And I think it's good that Singapore has, is looking at the wider issues of, of uh, the arts and sustainability. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions before I direct it to a panel member? Hi, um, my name is Vicky. I'm with One Heartbeat Percussions, um, a musician as well as an arts manager. Um, I would like to pose a question to perhaps Ian and um, Zi Qian, who mentioned about having a lot of time spent um, as part of your work teaching. Do you think teaching um, takes away time from your practice, or do you see it as a way to um, promote sustainability in a way that it introduces the young to your art form and in that sense create a new generation of artists that you could possibly mentor in the future? Yeah, good question. Uh, TC, you want to take it first? Yeah, um, I think what it is is that when I go and teach, I'm really, because I'm very aware that I'm in the medium of communication. When you write a play, when you pull up a play, you produce a play, you are trying to communicate an idea. So, and, and in my work, I don't speak to anyone in particular, I speak to everyone. So, so being well-versed in that language, and that theatrical language, means that I should be able to translate all these ideas, and I should be able to communicate that even to a three-year-old child. 
and, and even to someone who's well versed in theatre and someone who's maybe not a first, first time goer of, of theatre. I think, I think being in school, I think being, in, being forced to teach has forced me to be articulate and to be eloquent as, as, and articulate my ideas as clearly as I can. And I think, and I think many of, some, maybe some practitioners who feel that teaching takes time away from their work. But for me, art is not everything. Art is actually, it's, it's subsumed under life. I, first, as an artist, I have to live. I have to live first, and, and because I live, because I communicate, because I teach, I talk to people, I am inspired and therefore I put them into the things that I do. So for me, it's, it's, it's a holistic experience. Yeah, yeah um, I do enjoy talking to young artists, who, even if their practice is coming from different kinds of medium, you know, and I like talking to them about ideas, the way they live their life, and it keeps me um, fresh. Um, it keeps me also on my toes, and sometimes I learn from them rather than you know, me teaching them. And the word teach is quite a tricky word for me. Um, I like to use the whole idea. I like to think more about a kind of exchange of ideas. And also to think about what to say to them is very important as I grow longer in experience in teaching. Because if you say the wrong thing at the wrong time, you could destroy a life, you know, to put it even in a very extreme kind of way. Um, my own practice is painting, which is quite solitude kind of work. So it makes a lot of sense because when I finish my classes with my students, I need to get back to my studio and I, have, I just face with myself. So I, it kind of like balances really well. And I try, I was just talking to Kevin about my practice in the sense that I try to be militant about my practice because it's quite, we are living in a very pragmatic society. So for me, I do two hours a day, yeah, for my own practice, whether it's early in the morning or at night. And my studio also is, it's very practical in the sense that it's just passing by from school to my house. So I can sort of like, whether I'm going there to school or coming back, I could choose to clock in that two hours. And of course, not every day but I could do it, but I try to, to make that happen. Um, yeah. Thank you, Ian. If uh, there are no further questions, okay, one last one. Oh, Audrey Wong. Okay. Last two, and then I'm going to get punished, right? Am I going to get punished for the length? <laughs> Can we take two more? Just last two. Thank you. Hello, it's Karen again. Um, regarding um, uh, the economics um, factors, uh, other than ticket sales, uh, there's something called training, arts training, where people uh, pay for lessons. And I feel that there's um, one uh, economic factor. And to to answer sustainability beyond the financial part, there's also uh, during the teaching um, uh, sessions of the artist and the trainer and the teacher and the master trainer, um, uh, it's a sense of uh, sustainability as well in terms of sharing of arts and training and also the economics as in you pay for the lessons. So I wonder if um, these kind of things are captured in our measure for sustainability because it seems quite narrow just to um, talk about ticket sales because there are many ways you can be um, uh, looking at the financial aspect. And I think I just thought of one. I thought this is major. For example, I, I spend a lot of money on voice training. So more than I pay for the tickets because it's um, like once a month that I go for something. But training, I can train a couple of times every week. So um, I hope that there's more, there are more ways of measuring um, arts culture that is vibrant in Singapore. So I'm not the expert in, in such measures, but this, can anybody provide an insight to this kind of economic measure? And of course, the other side is um, arts culture about training and teaching, learning. Um, so this is part of the whole ecosystem as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, I guess the question is about whether or not we are looking, when we are looking yeah. at uh, measuring sustainability, let's say of an artist or an arts organisation, are we looking at not just the, um, the audience support via box office, but also all the other kinds of ways an, an arts group may make money? Um, whether or not it's through teaching yeah, and education I think the simple work. answer is yes. You can, you can ask Zichian. It's not just looking at the figures for ticket sales. 
it's not going to cut it. I, I think a lot of arts groups are very innovative already. They work with schools. Uh, they work with various communities. Um, you know, so all that is already considered in part of the, 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 state, the data that you've seen. And I believe but, through the, that feedback, survey on economic participation yes, of artists, that it will a, kind of capture the multifaceted... A clearer um, idea. Uh, but, you know, Janice, we were just saying before the, the presentation that I think the marketing um, needs to... Th there can be more attention, I think, whether by the council or by artists and arts groups, um, more innovative, enterprising ways in which we bring the arts to audiences... Can the Arts Council do something more along those lines? I think we Not need necessarily yeah. um, just uh, improving the advocacy or finding new ways of advocating yeah. to the private sector, for example, yeah. but also um, providing resources that enable artists and arts groups to find and develop those expertise and skills yeah. to develop, you know, to, to speak to sponsors and so yeah, on. Yeah, I think we, we should. We need to. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Audrey, last question and then thank you very much for, to everyone. Thank you, Janice. Hi, I'm Audrey Wong. I'm from La Salle, uh, former arts NMP. And actually, I want to pick up on a couple of things that particularly the artists have said about sustaining the craft and the practice of the artist, the art itself, which is a very important part of sus the sustainability discussion, right? I mean, like Zichen, you talked about your experience at TNS, how you were mentored, how you grew. Right? I know Hosea is working with a lot of young people and trying really hard to mentor them as well. That kind of continuation of passing on the craft, of encouraging and pushing people to be better at what they do as artists, I think that's, that's a, something that we haven't really discussed as a community. You know, everybody is doing their own thing. Um, so, are there ways and means? Uh, are there best practices? Are there, you know, things that we can learn from each other about how do we best keep, you know, improving on our craft as artists? Uh, Huzir, do you want to pick up, pick up on that point? I think um, mentorship works on, on a couple of levels. One is uh, uh, through the industry. Uh, I'm... I've been teaching playwriting at NUS for seven years, and of the 70-odd students I've had, about 30 of them have had their plays produced, um, some professionally, some within by university uh, theatre groups. And some of that is due to the fact that I actually place really good plays with people. I will send them to uh, Wild Rise, for instance, or I will send them to Bud's Theatre Company, and now people have come, started to come and ask, uh, do you have any really good new local plays from, from Fresh Voices? Um, so that kind of cross-pollination across theatre companies, across institutions, I think is very important. And then within uh, Checkpoint Theatre, we have just... Uh, the beginning of this year, taken on for a three-year period, five associate artists. They're people that we've worked with before who are, um, they're all writers, but some are also directors uh, and actors. And I think this is, this I will freely acknowledge is, is an experiment. We're just trying to make a commitment to these five incredibly talented and very different people uh, very different types of artists. We're trying to make a commitment to them to make sure that they develop as artists, that their work gets platformed, whether through productions, readings, publications. And that's something that we would like to continue. But the sustainability question is, for the five that I can take on now, there's still another 15 uh, of the 70 young people that I've met who are really, really incredible artists. But I can't, I can, I can, I, I'm barely confident enough saying to five people, yeah, come, let's work together. I'll try and do something for you, even if it's at the expense of, of my own work. But I can't say that to the other 15. I would love to, but, the, the, but we don't have enough time. We don't have enough energy. We don't have enough money. And in a Darwinistic sense, can Singapore support 20 new playwrights emerging, even if they are amazing, amazing, which they are? I think, I, I think I'll just add on quickly. I think um, what it is is that with the finger players, um, if you are, some of you may be familiar with his name, Oliver Chong, who is our resident director, he joined us in 2005 um, as, and, as an actor, an emerging actor. And, and what we, I, we, the company did was to give him money to fail. 
So we, in, within the first year that he joined the company, we gave him the money to do a production. And he was a first-time director, a first-time playwright, trying to stage a production. And, and year after year, season after season, we would give him that opportunity, that professional platform, to fail. I think that opportunity to fail is very, very important for any artist because it's only through failures that you learn and you learn the biggest mistakes and you, from those biggest mistakes, you feel the, and these, these, these mistakes become your biggest strength. And I think, I think right now he is a confident writer, confident director, confident actor. And I think be, I can't mentor everyone. I can't. But, but I, what I can do within my means I would get one or two emerging talents and give them the time to grow. And, and that's, what, that's what we did in the Finger Players. Yeah. Thank you, TC. And thank you, panelists, for um, joining us, for sharing your thoughts. I, I, I'm sorry I've held up the time. I know that there are breakout sessions now that will start. And I'll hand you over to the MC to give you all the details. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.